The way of the cross. Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. In this service we seek to walk with Jesus through the way of the cross. As we do so, we are all invited to imagine ourselves truly present with him in each unfolding scene of the gospel narrative, seeing and hearing all that is going on, putting ourselves in the crowd that we might reflect on the meaning and significance of his suffering and death. However, as we walk this road, we are reminded that the cross is not only the means by which Jesus saves us, but is itself the pattern of our salvation, the model and blueprint for how we as Jesus's followers are called to live. Therefore, we survey the wondrous cross together today, not only that we might be drawn deeper into wonder, love and praise, but that we might also learn from our crucified Lord how to pray, how to bear witness, how to forgive, how to hope, and how to love. Therefore, as we begin our journey with Jesus, let us pray together. Eternal God, in the cross of Jesus, we see the cost of our sin and the depth of your love. In humble hope and fear, may we place at his feet all that we have and all that we are through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us sing together. How deep the Father's love for us Beyond all measure That he should give his only son To make a wretch his treasure How great the pain of searing love his face away as wounds which mother chosen one bring many sons to glory
The first station, Jesus in agony in the garden of Gethsemane. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John, and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Here in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see Jesus wrestling with God in prayer. Anyone who says that prayer is easy is lying. Real prayer is exceedingly difficult. The Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard writes, If a person does not yield himself completely in prayer, he is not praying, even if he were to stay down on his knees day and night. Let the one who prays see to it that the prayer is proper, a yielding of himself in the inner being, because otherwise he is not praying to God. Jesus is fully aware of what lies ahead. At this point in the story, we must remember that Jesus can still slip off under the cover of darkness among the throngs of Passover pilgrims camped on the Mount of Olives and live. In words which will comfort even the most faint-hearted of the faithful, we hear that our Lord himself did not want to endure the cross. He wanted God to find him a way out. And for this, Jesus begged his Father, with whom all things are possible. Nevertheless, Jesus says, Yet not what I want, but what you want. Gethsemane is a picture of total surrender to God. Jesus did not want the cross. Who would want the cross? Rather, Jesus wanted what God wanted, and if that was the cross, then so be it. To put conditions on our obedience to God is to be disobedient. It is to say that what we want is more important than what God wants. Jesus models for us the beauty of willing submission, sublimating his wants, to the wants of the Father. Lord Jesus, 
teach us to pray. Give us hearts that want what you want and to place God's will for us above our own, such that we might say with the Apostle Paul, it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. Amen. Station 2. Jesus betrayed by Judas and arrested. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. Earlier that evening, Jesus had knelt before Judas, stripped to the waist, and had taken the place of the lowliest servant in society at the time by gently holding his feet in his hands to wash away the muck and the mud and the mire of life's journeys. Jesus' loving service to his disciples was an enacted sign, a prefiguring of what he goes on to say is the ultimate act of friendship, that of laying down one's life for another. The pain of Judas's betrayal is the pain of friendship rejected. All day long I have held out my hands to an obstinate people, God says through the prophet Isaiah. Like the famous depiction of the creation of Adam painted by Michelangelo on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, God strains every sinew to impart the spark of life to humanity. God's index finger is fully extended but Adam reclining lazily on his right elbow, his body weight centred away from God, will not even lift a finger, literally, to meet God's coming finger. God wants us to want him. The betrayal of Judas is symbolic of all humanity's refusal of life from God's hand. This is what we do to a God who tries to love us. Thus a kiss, the sign of love and intimacy, the sign of peace and friendship, becomes the means by which Jesus, the Son of God, is given into the hands of sinners. Yet God loves us still, and through the cross of Jesus opens wide the hand of friendship to a guilty world. He kissed a guilty world in love, as the hymn says. Let us not betray Jesus again with words and actions that only feign faith and love. Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. Forgive us our hypocrisy. Forgive us the ways we reject the friendship you so graciously offer. Forgive us the ways we continue to betray you with worship that is merely superficial. Worship that fails to touch the heart. Amen. Station 3. Jesus condemned by the Sanhedrin. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. 
Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. He was silent. Jesus, the divine Logos, the eternal word of God the Father, through whom all things in heaven and on earth came into being, was silent. Silence is not something we commonly associate with Jesus. We think of Jesus as the teacher who taught us the parables of God's kingdom, as the healer who commanded demons to leave, paralysed people to walk, as the God in man who hushed the raging waters, who spoke assurance of forgiveness to sinners. He was silent. How unlike us he is. For when we are the victims of misunderstanding or false accusation, we are all too eager to clear our name, to seek to put the record straight, to try and get ourselves off the hook. But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus had dedicated himself as a sin offering for us in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus had already surrendered himself to what lay ahead. And in what sounds like the report of an opening hearing in a court today, Jesus spoke only to confirm his name. I am. He was silent. The great prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon, writes that Jesus knows that nothing can be said to excuse human guilt. And therefore, he who bore its whole weight stood speechless before his judge. Truly, as the prophet Isaiah said, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Lord Jesus, help us to hear your silence before your accusers, not as something weak, but rather as the strong determination of your self-sacrificing trust in God on our behalf. Thank you that you became sin for us, that in you, we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. Station four, Peter denies Jesus. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you are talking about. And he went out into the forecourt. Then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again, he denied it. Then, after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know this man you are talking about. And at that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. 
Peter was at least closer than the other disciples. We're told that the rest of Jesus' disciples deserted him and fled when he was arrested. That Peter had made it as far as the courtyard of the high priest is, in my opinion at least, no mean feat. James, John and the others were probably halfway back to Galilee by then. Yes, Peter's spirit was clearly willing, but as we see, his flesh was weak. And as the proverb says, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We just don't have it in us to love God. In some ways, Peter's denial of Jesus is itself evidence of the need for Jesus's death. For even if we want to obey God, the power to do so simply does not reside within us. We fail to live up to the standards God expects of us. We need help from outside. We need a saviour whose perfect obedience to God will stand in our stead and whose spirit will infuse us to such an extent not only to release us from the guilt of sin, but to release us from its power over us and presence in us also. Mark tells us that when Peter remembered the words of Jesus, he broke down and wept. However, there was healing in those tears. For when we despair of ourselves, we are ready to be met by the grace of God. Following a crucified Messiah is not easy. He never promised that it would be. Like Peter, we too are tempted to keep Jesus at a distance and deny knowing him, both in what we say and in what we do. If only we knew it was safer to die with him than to live without him. Lord Jesus, we want to be near you, yet we are afraid to draw too near lest the world crucifies us like it crucified you. Forgive us when our lives deny you. Amen. Station 5. Jesus judged by Pilate. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Pilate asked them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. It was an act of calculated political expediency. The city of Jerusalem was full of pilgrims who had come from all over the country and even farther afield to celebrate the Passover. Even though Pilate could see that Jesus had done nothing wrong, nothing deserving of the death penalty, it was easier for him to acquiesce with the injustice than to stand up for the truth. Dare Pilate risk inciting a revolt at the city's busiest time of year by denying the crowd's increasingly insistent demand? Evidently not. And so, despite knowing it was wrong, he handed Jesus over to be executed in the cruelest way the Romans knew how, thus earning himself eternal infamy in the words of the creed which reminds us every time we say it, that Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Why? Because, as Mark tells us, he wished to satisfy the crowd. How stark a contrast is this to Jesus, who, knowing the agony of what lay before him, prayed in dark Gethsemane that he might satisfy God alone. Pilate's actions prompt us to consider who we wish to satisfy. It's easy for us to say that we live for God. But when push comes to shove, when God's way is harder and more difficult 
and costlier than simply going along with the crowd. What then? God calls each one of us to be a mouthpiece for truth and justice. God calls us to be light, to live a different way, and in doing so to expose and dispel the darkness around us, a darkness which others might conveniently seek to ignore. Lord Jesus, forgive us for the times when we ignore what we know is wrong and go along with the crowd in ways that we know contradict your will. Forgive us when we are led more by fear of the crowd than our courageous love for you. Give us hearts which seek only to please you. Make us brave that we might be mouthpieces for truth and justice in the places that you put us. Amen. Station 6. Jesus scourged and crowned with thorns. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? These majestic words of Isaac Watts' great hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, capture the scene beautifully. And yet I wonder how many of us truly believe that there never was so rich a crown as the twisted crown of thorns that the soldiers made for Ju Jesus in cruel mockery of him that first Good Friday. St Edward's crown, which a new British monarch wears briefly during their coronation ceremony, has been estimated to be worth in excess of £3.6 million. Its sapphires alone are thought to be worth nearly half that total. Yet the crown of thorns worn by Jesus as he is scourged is of even greater value. To be sure, it was made for him in spiteful jest. However, in words George Herbert ascribes to Jesus in his magisterial poem, The Sacrifice, I who am truth turn into truth their deeds. Jesus is not the kind of king we or anybody else expected. Rather, as theologian Stanley Havas writes, this king triumphs not through violent revolt, but by being for Israel the one able to show it that its worship of God is its freedom. The crown of thorns is a parody, but not of Christ. Rather, it is a parody of our tight-fisted, self-centred, insecure fascination with power as a means of controlling others. Jesus' crown of thorns isn't an imitation. It's the real thing. The crown as the cross is Christ's glory. Lord Jesus, you are the King of glory. You are the King above all kings. We bend the knees of our hearts before you, bringing before you all that we have and all that we are. Give us the eyes of faith to see the crucifixion as your coronation and the thorns upon your brow as your crown. Amen. Station 7. Jesus carries the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. 
After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Today, the church ponders Christ's passion. However, it is not a passion as we usually use that word. That is, a great feeling of excitement or enthusiasm about something, or a strong, powerful, almost uncontrollable emotion like love or jealousy or anger. To be sure, Jesus' death on the cross was driven by a passionate love of our love. But the passion of which we speak today is different. The passion of which we speak today derives from the Latin word passio, meaning suffering. Yet even the word suffering fails to get at what today is really about. Because suffering is about more than undergoing pain, distress or hardship. It is about being passive. It is about being done to. It is about being subject to something or someone else's influence or control. When the King James Version of the Bible translates Jesus saying to his disciples, suffer the little children to come unto me, it doesn't mean that their coming is going to hurt Jesus. Rather, suffering means giving up control. Then they led him out to crucify him, Mark says. They led him. Jesus, God in the flesh, the ever active divine subject, the word of God the Father by whom all creation was called into being, who healed the sick, drove out demons, raised the dead, is now made into an object of others' doings. He is led like a lamb to the slaughter. We like to be busy, active, doing things, in control. But Jesus saves the world by giving up control and by determining to live and die by the mercy of God. Lord Jesus, give us courage that we might learn to live lives out of our own control. Help us day by day to place our lives in your hands, trusting that they are safer there than in our own. Minister your grace especially to those who this day, whether through ill health or old age, are dependent upon the help of others. Amen. Station 8. Simon of Cyrene helps Jesus to carry the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Simon's life took a most unexpected detour that day. There he was, minding his own business, having come in from the country, when suddenly he is enlisted by Roman soldiers to carry the cross of a condemned man on his way to die. He didn't ask for this. He was compelled. The Gospels don't tell us how or why he was selected for the task, or how he responded to it. Just that he did. I suspect that he simply had the misfortune of being in the wrong place, at the wrong time. Or was he? You see, the very fact that the Gospel writer Mark records his name and the names of his sons, Alexander and Rufus, suggests that the task for which he was unwillingly conscripted had a profound, even life-changing impact upon him. Why else would Mark, who is known for his economy in writing, bother to include such trivial details as the names of Simon and his sons, unless Simon and his sons were known to the church community, unless someone they knew took part in this shocking story. 
Simon may not have been a follower of Jesus at the start of the day, but I suspect that he may have been by the end of it. Indeed, though it was Jesus's cross, Simon of Cyrene in North Africa was the first person to take up a cross and follow Jesus. Edwin Muir, in his poem, The Killing, imagines Simon asking, did a God indeed in dying cross my life that day by chance? He on his road and I on mine? Today, a God in dying crosses our life. Let us pray that he may cross the lives of many more. Lord Jesus, we pray for those we know, our families, our friends, our colleagues, our neighbours and acquaintances who do not yet know you or your great, endless, unfathomable love for them. Cross their paths as you crossed Simon's and draw them as you drew Simon into the community of your grace. Amen. Station 9. Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading from the Gospel according to Luke. A great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? There is a tragedy even greater than the suffering and death Jesus experiences. The tragedy of being blind to what is happening. The tragedy of watching this sad story unfold and not doing anything about it. The tragedy of refusing the opportunity that is before them to repent and follow Jesus. As Jesus nears the cross, he knows that he will bear God's just judgment against sin on our, on our behalf. If he doesn't bear the burden for us, then we must bear it ourselves. Jesus asks the women of Jerusalem, if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Others had come before Jesus claiming to be the Messiah and promising the conquest of the people's Roman overlords. But Jesus was no rebel leader. His kingdom isn't of this world, brought in through violent revolution and bloody struggle. No, as Tom Wright explains, if the Romans crucify the Prince of Peace, what will they do to genuine warlords? Jesus died the death of those Rome considered a threat to its imperial power. And as Tom Wright goes on to say, the one was bearing the sins of the many. But if the many refuse to repent of their violence, then the fate in store for them will make his crucifixion seem mild by comparison. As Jesus goes to the cross, he goes on behalf of God's people. But there is a stark warning here also, because if he doesn't go for us, if we refuse his representation, we will have to go for ourselves. Lord Jesus, Prince of Peace, let us not witness your crucifixion and fail to be moved by it. Grant us true repentance, that we may place our whole hope in you and live. Amen. Station 10. 
Jesus is crucified. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading according to the Gospel of Luke. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. Jesus died as he lived, in the midst of sinners. Indeed, it is the most common criticism levelled against Jesus in the Gospels. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. However, as Jesus both explained and demonstrated, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. The eminent Swiss theologian of the last century, Karl Barth, asks, which is more amazing, to find Jesus in such bad company or to find the criminals in such good company? Both are true. Indeed, Bart goes further still by making the really rather audacious claim that the two criminals were the first certain Christian community. In other words, they were the first church. Because, he says, what it means to be the church is to be the community of the crucified. It is to be a people who are close to Jesus. It is to be numbered with him who is willing to be numbered with us in the death our sins deserve. The death Jesus died, he died for those around him. Sinners, like those on his left and right. Sinners, like us. God in Christ so fully and freely identified himself with us in our human plight, that he became guilty by association. Guilt by association means that you personally didn't do something wrong, but because you are so closely tied to those who did, you are held guilty too. It means that you are judged by the company you keep, and so can be viewed as guilty simply because of your relationship with them. Jesus chose to become guilty by association with us. Even if that association were to get him killed. Lord Jesus, wounded healer, friend of sinners, in your great love for us, you embraced the deepest, darkest depth of our human sinfulness at the cross. Give us faith to hear and to receive the good news of forgiveness, that we are pronounced innocent by association with you, just as you were pronounced guilty by association with us. Amen. Station 11. Jesus promises the kingdom to the penitent thief. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading from the Gospel according to Luke. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, Today you will be with me in paradise. How will we respond to the God in dying 
who crosses our path today. This scene shows us two very different possibilities. Either we can mock and taunt with the first man because Jesus doesn't conform to the image of a saviour that we want or think we need. Or we can ask as the second man does to be remembered by Jesus when he comes into his kingdom. For as the Apostle Paul recognised in Galatians 4 verse 9, even more important than knowing God is being known by him. Today you will be with me in paradise, says Jesus. Today, with me, paradise. These words of Jesus from the cross say so much. They remind us that paradise is not a location on a map. It is not somewhere you can find on Google Street View. It is not a fluffy white cloud in the sky where we go when we die. The word paradise originally referred to a walled royal garden. The Greek translation of the Old Testament used this word to describe the Garden of Eden. But what made the Garden of Eden the Garden of Eden was the presence of God. As theologian Will Willimon observes, paradise is whenever wherever you are with Jesus. And therefore the thief didn't have to wait to experience paradise. He could be in paradise today. Yes, even as he hung upon a cross. We don't have to wait until tomorrow, until we die to be with Jesus. We can be with him today. The presence of Jesus is able to sanctify even the hell itself. Today, with me, paradise. Lord Jesus, your power to save knows no bounds, no limits, no restraints. Break the chains of guilt and shame that bind us and grant us that experience of paradise, which is to be with you in whatever situation we face. Continue to enter through prison doors today, proclaiming deliverance to the captives within, and making saints of sinners, as you always have, and always will. Amen. Station 12. Jesus on the cross, his mother and his friend. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading from the Gospel according to John. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. Women lived a precarious enough existence in the world of the day as it was, even more so without a husband, even more so without the eldest son to take care of her. It has been said that Jesus' concern for the practical well-being of his mother at the moment of his death is the pinnacle of his unsurpassed compassion. That is no doubt true. However, there is something even more revolutionary going on in these words from the cross than merely the making of new domestic arrangements. No, Jesus is making a new family. Jesus' ideas of family values is decidedly different to ours. We catch glimpses of this throughout Jesus' life and ministry. When he goes up to the temple as a boy and goes missing because he had to be in his Abba's house. When he calls a, a couple of fishermen to leave their father in the boat and to take off to follow him. When his family shows up to one of Jesus' sermons wanting to talk to him and he replies, Whoever does God's will is my mother and sister and brother. According to Jesus, anyone who tries to follow him in faith is part of the family. Not only is the cross the means by which we enter 
a new relationship with God. It is also the means by which we enter new relationships with one another. At the foot of the cross, we are bound together by bonds of grace with every other sinner who comes to Christ seeking refuge. This is my blood of the new covenant, says Jesus. Through his sacrificial death, sinful strangers become blood relations. Lord Jesus, we thank you for inviting us to be part of your new family, bound together by the blood you shed for us all. Give us your church grace to act like the family we are in you. Help us to receive all whom you call to yourself and all who do the will of God as our true and dearly loved brothers and sisters. Amen. Station 13. Jesus dies on the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. At three o'clock Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. When the world shook and the sun was wiped out of heaven, G.K. Chesterton writes, it was not at the crucifixion, but at the cry from the cross the cry which confessed that God was forsaken of God. In words that struggle to understand the enormity of what takes place here, he continues, let the atheists themselves choose a God. They will find only one divinity who ever uttered their isolation, only one religion in which God seemed for an instant to be an atheist. In these days of social distancing and self-isolation in response to the coronavirus crisis, we may perhaps feel more than ever before something of the profound loneliness that Jesus experienced at the cross. Yet no matter how alone we feel, how sad it is to have to maintain a two trolley distance between us and the next shopper at Tesco, it is but the most fleeting glimpse at the terror of isolation which Jesus utters as he bears in himself the sin that separates him from his Father. Here at the cross, Jesus, who the beginning of John's Gospel declares was close to the Father's heart, literally in his bosom. Jesus, who himself had once said, I and the Father are one. Now he is only a deafening silence from heaven. God the Son is in agony on the cross, and God the Father does nothing to save him from it. In order to demonstrate God's love for a wayward world, it is as if a tear is made in the heart of the Trinity itself. Here is God, risking God's very self in order to save us. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, grant us peace. Station 14, Jesus laid in the tomb. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. 
There is no doubt about it. Jesus, the way, the truth and the life, was dead. Jesus, who had raised the dead, now himself hung lifeless upon the cross. The Romans were expert killers. The idea that somehow he was merely half dead as Joseph took him down from the cross is frankly preposterous. In fact, we're told that before granting Joseph Jesus his body, Pilate insisted on hearing the duty centurion's report firsthand. We're told Pilate was surprised that Jesus had died so soon. It was certainly a brave move asking for the body of a man who was crucified for being king of the Jews. We know very little about Joseph of Arimathea, save that he was a reputable member of the Jewish council who eagerly longed for the kingdom. As Tom Wright says, we must assume that this means he had been a keen though secret supporter of Jesus, and that he must have decided that if Jesus had died, he had nothing more to lose by doing what he knew to be right. Joseph's gutsy actions are a sign of baptism. For Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, if we have been united with Christ in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Joseph's close identification with Jesus and his death is a picture of what every disciple must do if they are to partake in Jesus's risen life. They must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow him. But they do so with the promise that if they die with Christ, they will also live with him. Lord Jesus, we want to know you. We want to know the power of your resurrection and participation in your sufferings, becoming like you in your death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Give us the courage we need to be known as yours and live as yours in a world that crucified you. Amen. Standing at the foot of the cross, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We sing together our closing hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
our closing prayer. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. We preach Christ crucified, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Mm -hmm.